ministry. Excited about being a minister. I was just the opposite. I, I something I didn't want to do. I always known it. I mean, I've known it since I was a little kid, but I, it was still I was just what I didn't want to do. I didn't want to preach. I didn't want to. I didn't want to. I didn't want to lead anybody. The only thing I wanted to do was do Irvin. And that really didn't help me out a whole lot, but I wanted to do Irvin. My head was this big. I was egotistical. I thought I was all of this and wasn't anything. And I just wanted to do me. I think if there was a God and God wanted to show how much he cared and what a good God he is, he'd create somebody like Irvin. So that every time you see Irvin, you know, boy, that's a good God. I hope when I grow up one day, I can be just like him. I see God at his best. What a mistake. But finally, I came to a place in my walk when wife and I, we had been out there in the street for such a long time. And I came to this place in my walk and I said, okay, God, I'm yours. Problem with it was, that was okay, that was cool. And when he started now bringing back up the ministry part, that's when I started backing up and, and I didn't want to hear that. And I started putting God through some paces and some challenges because the one thing I said, Lord, I, and in fact, at one point I told him, you know, anything but that. Now, how come I can't just do what I'm doing and, and be that? Because that wasn't what he created me to do. But one night when I was, I had been praying about this, am I to go into the ministry? Now, suddenly what I've lived with for years suddenly became a question mark. You know, I, I knew what I've been called to do. But now I'm going to God, are you sure you called me? I've been knowing this my whole life. Suddenly it turns into a question mark. Are you sure, Lord, I need some sign. I need something to tell me what I already know down in my heart to be true. But yet I need to hear something. I need you to do something. And I remember I went to sleep one night. And there were several other little things that he did. One of them, my little trip I took. And I talked a little bit about that and today. But one of the other things that he did was he gave me a dream one night over a scripture I had read and for some reason I couldn't get away from it. And so I want to read that scripture and I really, I'm, I'm, I'm a person who writes. I like my notes, I like my scriptures all laid out. I, I'm praying, I believe in God, this is the direction, this is the area where you want to take me, and I want to be sure that I've covered all my bases. Now what I do when we get there, what you choose to do is your business, but I want to be sure that I'm thorough when I do something. I want to think and I want to pray it through. And so when you see me come up without a whole bunch of notes, something going on. And I was talking to God about this because he wasn't really giving me a bunch of notes to write. And, and, and one of the reasons I like notes is because I don't know. I've got probably, I don't know, maybe a hundred different little composition books full of nothing but notes and different things over the years and, minutes and, session and, and, and sermons and stuff that God has given me and teaching things that God has given me and shared them and, and I store them because I don't know. Maybe it hasn't anything to do with me writing them down. Maybe it's what somebody's going to pick up 10 years from now or 20 years from now. And it's things that will make sense to them that they'll find themselves coming to know God. I don't know. I have no idea. But it's what I normally do. But this one scripture came to mind and when I was praying that night and, and it stuck with me. And every once in a while I pull it out and I'll look at that scripture again and this morning with the intentions of not going to this scripture, I opened up my Bible. I want to go to where I want to go. And the first thing I looked down is there is that scripture again. And I thought maybe it's what I ought to do this morning. So if you just bear with me, we will be out of here. But it's in Matthew the 8th chapter. One, two, three. One, two. Two, 
I had, as I share it, I had read this scripture and for some reason I could never turn this scripture loose. But it hung with me. Here's what the King, New King James Version says. And even the beginning of the first verse seems to me like it set things up. It says, when he had come down from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, and, and I struggled because I wonder what, he just told me great multitudes of people is following him. So there's these, here's Jesus, there's these people everywhere. You know, I don't know what a multitude really consists of. The best that I can do is that that seems like a whole lot of people. I don't know what a multitude is. But it seems like you're starting to get into the numbers where you can't really get a good count and, and it takes a moment and you'll probably never get an accurate number. To me, that's what a multitude is. But then he goes on, he says, it's great multitudes. And he also throw the word great in it, that this thing, that must have been people everywhere. And with all these people there and all these people there surrounding him, so I, I, I struggle with the next second verse. It says, and behold, a leper came and worshipped him. How could a leper get, in, get to him, even with all what we've just seen? If you could just imagine the folks gathering around him. And the leper said, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. Then Jesus put out his hand and touched him, saying, I am willing to be cleansed. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed or gone. He wasn't who he used to be. He didn't look like he used to look. He could do things that he hadn't done before. Suddenly he was clean. And, and I fell asleep on that scripture and I found myself waking up only when I woke up. I was in this situation years ago, and it's like I took place with the leper. And as I was standing there, I began to look around at myself, and my clothes was raggedy, and my smell was bad. And as I noticed that as I walked, there was a lot of pain in my body. My feet hurt, my joints hurt. Uh, there was just pain everywhere. And I remember as a leper, I was on this road, I was walking down this road, and I was by myself. And as I walked, I noticed there was no one. No one. I was tired. In fact, I can't remember when I had been so tired in my whole life. And I was walking. And, and it seems like the simplest thing to do when you're tired is go find a place to sit down. But in my head, I knew I couldn't sit down. And the reason I couldn't sit down was because I wasn't like other people. The reason I couldn't sit down because because of my leprosy, I couldn't hang out with everybody else. You see, you, you don't realize how much you take people for granted. When you got some family, and some of us got the idea that we can smear our nose up at our family, we can look at our family. Listen, you better appreciate what you got. Because it could be taken away from you. Yeah, but you don't know what they did to me. You better appreciate what you got. Because you don't know how much longer you're going to have them. And here's this leper, and he's walking down, and, and it isn't just the pain that's going on in his body, but the pain of loneliness is hurting him even more. Because see, being a leper, he can't just walk up and sit in a service like this because he's unclean. And being unclean means he can't hang around people who don't have leprosy. 
The only people that he can run with is people that have leprosy. But let me tell you something. When you look around and you see other people going through what you're going through, sometimes you got to get a break. You got to get away from them because they keep reminding you of just how bad things are in your life. See, when I was strung out, and I remember drugging and, and, and at a point in my life and I looked around and I realized I can't get any help from any of those that are in here because they going through the same thing I'm going through. And there's a, a loneliness, a loneliness that most of us can't even imagine. You see, you're not ever going to get involved and get invited to somebody's dinner. You don't get to see your nephews. You don't get to see your nieces. You don't get to see any of those as they grow up. You don't get to hold the baby because, see, even if you was around, they're going to tell you to back off because you can't hold my baby because of your leprosy. You don't get to do what other people do. And, and in fact, there's something about it that other people want to get their distance away from you. They really don't want you getting too close. The kids learn something very early is that when they see one of these nasty, raggedy people coming along, you throw rocks at them so they keep going. You don't want them to sit down. You don't want them to get comfortable with you. You don't want them to hang out with you. So you throw rocks at them so they'll keep going. Find some place else to go, but not here. And being a leper in my, my head, I was so tired. I was so sick of what I was. And I couldn't do nothing about it. Listen. See, you got to understand the mind that was going on. Listen, all I want to do, if somebody could just, if you would just be willing, just sit down, talk with me. Sit down, make me feel like I'm human. I'm not a thing. I'm not a monster. I'm not, I'm not all that. I'm just another human. I'm, I can't help the fact that I've got leprosy on me. But treat me like I'm human. Let me know you still love me. Let me know that you still care for me. Don't back me away. Don't push me away. Let me know I'm important to you. And I didn't understand why am I dreaming this. And then it seemed like I began to get these flashes of my own life in him. And I began to see things in my own life. And I began to relate that to the leper. And I started realizing moments in my life when I felt so alone and nobody cared and nobody wanted me. Everybody wanted to keep their distance from me. I remember before me and Merlin got married, all of her sisters going to jump on me so that I wouldn't hook up with Merlin. They had good reason. Because I was a dog. And they knew I was a dog. So they didn't want me hanging out with her. They wanted me to keep go find somebody else. I remember we grew up, we were called Wrens because my stepdad was a Wren. And we knew something about being Paul. See, we grew up in a little town called Smelter, a little place in Cape Girardeau called Smelterville. And Smelterville was like this little place that you, you separated everything. If you was poor, if you was nobody, if you was not going anywhere, then you had to live down there. That's where we lived, only a couple of places, Smelterville and Good Hope. Other than that, you didn't live. You didn't get to move in the other parts of the good town. You didn't have a good home. You didn't have all that because Smelterville was for the losers. That's why all the losers stayed. And no matter where you went, no matter what you did, you was recognized as a loser. We had a smell on us that we couldn't get off of. Us because the packing house is down where we were and because there was a big all thing down where we were and we had this smell on us so when we go to school we couldn't help it we couldn't people smelt the smell we smelt like meat we smelt like chitlins all the time and even though we would wash our clothes and my mama my grandma was a clean person but you couldn't it was in the water it was in the air it was in everything we did so the smell of smelterville was upon us and they would make fun of us when 
when we'd go to school and they would separate us and we couldn't hang out with the other kids because we were smelling. See, I understand a little bit about what the leper was going through. Amen. Understand when all you want to do is just be liked by somebody and people don't like you just because of who you are, because of where you come from. Yeah. understand what it's like when, when, when all you just simply want to do is fit in. And when you're a kid, it's even harder because you don't understand it. It don't make sense. Why should we not play with each other? I grew up in the 60s when black people and white people didn't mix too well in the 50s and they didn't mix too well because we were to stay on this side of town and they were to stay on that side of town. But every once in a while, every once a little black boy and a little white boy would get together and they would become friends and people would want to break that up and separate them. They didn't want them playing with each other. And so each one would teach it. The black parent would teach the, the young kid to stay away from the white and the white would teach their kids to stay away from the black and there was this wall that was between us that we couldn't cross I shared with you I remember one day because of the smell, I went to school, and I'm in high school now. I'm in, in junior high school in my tennis shoes. See, some of y'all, y'all got five, six, seven pair of tennis shoes, and you got your little name brands and all that, and you feel like you're doing something when you put on your little hundred-something dollar tennis shoe. Well, we didn't have no hundred dollar tennis shoe. We had some five dollar tennis shoes, and we were glad to put them on our feet because even then, when they wore out, we still had to wear them anyway. You put some cardboard in the bottom, and you went on about your business anyway. And I remember you wore them every day. You stepped in water, and sometimes the water, it would begin to stink. The shoes begin to smell. And I remember sitting inside of my high school class, and they begin to make fun of me and talk about me and say, do you smell something? And the others begin to say, I think it's Urban's tennis shoes. And I'm a teenager, and you don't know the harm that it does to a teenager. That's right. The teenager got enough issues trying to deal with who they are and trying to figure out how do they fit in all of this because it seemed like mama and daddy and grandma and everybody, every adult that turned against them. And they started laughing. I remember feeling so bad. I just kind of wanted to try to tuck my head. I wouldn't look up for nothing. Because I knew if I'd look up, I'd break out crying. And I, wasn't going, I just didn't want to, I didn't want to cry. Couldn't wait to get out of that class. I remember I went home that night. And I got home some of my grandma's cheap perfume. And I sprayed my shoes real good. And I said, they ain't going to make fun of me no more. Because when I go to school, I'm going to be smelling good now. And I remember going to school and I was sitting in the classroom again. And they began to say, do you smell it? Do you smell it? And I'm sitting there, and then somebody said, I think it's Irvin's tennis shoes. Smells like cheap perfume, and I couldn't handle it. And I'm sitting there, and I'm a teenager, and I don't want to cry. I remember the tears beginning to run down my face. I wanted to, but I made my mind up that day. I made a decision in my heart, and here's what I said. I said, if one of them get too close to me, if they even say anything to me, it's going to be on. We're going to tell, we're going to, anybody from this point on ever say anything. They got a fight on their hands. And I spent the next several years fighting. That's all I did was fight. I fought with everybody. I fought with the teachers. I fought with the principals. I fought with the classmates. There was a, there was a, a, a big stick on my shoulder, and I dared anybody to knock it off. And I didn't even care whether I'd win or whether I'd lose. All I know, if you mess with me, the fight's going to be on. It's just that simple. I don't care about nothing else. You don't care about me. I don't care about you. Mess with me. We was rings. We was taught, if you mess with one of us, you got to whoop all of us. That's how we was taught. So if anybody messed with one of the wrens, you just had a fight on your hand. And if you said, I don't know, all them up, that's just the way it was. I fought, 
my brothers, my sisters fought. We all just fought. And it seemed like nothing was coming together. And it seemed like I could not, I could not, could not pull it together. It seemed like everything I did, it always went wrong. It seemed like whatever I did, somebody's got a criticism. Been there, some of y'all been there. It seems like even when you try to do right, somebody's got a criticism about it. Somebody got something to say about it. Even when you try to do your best, somebody always got to tear it down. And sometimes you can go for years living like that, living like that. Yes, I made some mistakes. How long are you going to hold it against me? How long do I have to still carry this shame because you the one won't drop it? I want to move on, but you won't let me move on now. Then when it's in the family, it's even worse. Huh? When it's in the family, when you, when you need to get a word from a, a maybe from a parent, Instead of giving you a word, they tear you down too. Huh. You're looking for somebody to say something good to you. And instead what they do is they just tear you down. And you feel alone. You feel alone. You can be in a room full of people. But that loneliness is still there. That loneliness is still eating at you. And people come up to you. They shake your hands. They smile at you. But you feel alone. You feel like you're all by yourself. See, somebody didn't understand loneliness. See, I thought being alone and being lonely was the same thing. I found out that ain't true. Because sometimes with all the people around you, you still feel alone. You still feel lonely. You still feel lost. You still don't feel a part of. Yeah, I didn't like feeling like the leper. See, and here's the sad part about the leper is that when his clothes wore out, he couldn't go into town and get, us, get some more. But you're talking about me because I'm raggedy, but you won't let me come in where I can do something about my raggedy, so I got to stay the same way that I am. You're talking about me because I smell, but then you don't give me any water to wash with, so I can't help but to keep on smelling. It's like I'm trapped and I can't get out of it. I remember feeling it so strongly. And I, I remember just, just walking. I remember seeing this big old tree up ahead. And I thought, and I realized it wasn't, listen, it wasn't the pain in my body that weighted me down and hurt me as much as it was the pain of loneliness. Because I couldn't measure up to anybody. Everybody decided what I am. And it ain't good enough just because everybody decided. But now there's a law that says I got to tell everybody what I am. You ever done some time in, in the penitentiary and you got to walk around now you got to tell everybody, I'm an ex-con, I'm an ex-con, I'm an ex-con. Everybody, you got to tell, I'm an ex watch it, I'm an ex-con. But I just served my time. I just paid it out. How come you still got me trapped? Sometimes we do it with ourselves. We do it with prostitutes. We do it with drug addicts. We do it with other people. She used to be a prostitute. Why are you bringing that up? She's not a prostitute anymore. Why are you still trying to put a label on her? Why do you want to put a label on people? And you, I'm still, I'm, I might as well just be it because if you're going to keep calling me that and now you're telling me i got to call myself that, I'm trapped and I can't get out. Yeah. 
just tired. And I seen the tree. And I went to the tree. Just listen. God, why? 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 Why am I still alive? God, why me? What did you do to me, Lord? Sit down. Because see, when you finish talking to God, you're still a leper. You're still lonely. You're still hurting. Some of us have been there. I'll tell you, sitting on the side of the bed with a joint in my head and a line of cocaine and some alcohol on the side and I'm sitting looking up and I'm talking about oh God, I want to break. I want to get out of this. I want out, God. <laughs> then I'd smoke the joint, I'd snort the coke and then I'd turn around and drink the alcohol and go back to sleep again. Yeah only to wake up the next morning and I was still the same thing. I was still the same person. Kill me. I understand Joe. Maybe some of y'all don't get it. I understand Joe. Maybe he should have never said it, but I understand Joe. When Joe said, why was I ever born? I curse the day of my birth. I didn't do anything to anybody to deserve this. You sit there, or I did, by the tree, alone. Even the dogs don't want to have nothing to do with you because you smell so bad they think you're dead. You feel like calling it. You can't even afford a sword to cut your throat. You're just there. As I sit there, just tired of life, wanting to die, couldn't find a reason for living. I remember looking up way off at the distance. I could see a silhouette of a man and it seemed like, it seemed like he was covered or the sun was behind him and all I could see was his silhouette. And he was coming my way. And for a moment, my heart jumped. And I thought, maybe, maybe somebody will say hi. Maybe, may, just maybe this one time, things will be different. Maybe he won't treat me like it. And my heart jumped for a moment. And I tried raising myself up. And I got up by the tree. And I looked. And then despair came. I says, he's just going to say the same thing. Because see, when he gets close enough, I got to tell him I'm a leper. I got to tell him I'm unclean. I got to tell him I don't fit in. And he's going to turn around and step away. And I'm still going to be alone. And he's going to look at me with those eyes that I know that I'm less than a human being to him. So I wanted to sit back down, but I couldn't sit back down. So I stood, and he, as he started getting closer, I was scared to go to him because I knew what he would say. So I couldn't go to him, but he kept coming, and he kept coming. But there was something about it as he kept coming. There was something going on on the inside of me that said, maybe this time is going to be different. Maybe this time here, maybe he's not going to look at me with those eyes. Maybe he's not going to tear me down any longer. And he kept coming and coming, and finally he got close enough. And then the thing that I saw that changed everything, there was a smile on his face. Can you imagine that you go for years and nobody ever smile at you? You can't even remember the last time somebody just, you know, how, you know how you can put that look on somebody to make them feel like they less than anybody? You know how to do it. You've done it. 
And the real problem is, is that they done something that you didn't do. But if they knew what you do, you wouldn't be any better off than they were. Because suddenly you got the idea because you didn't do what they do, you're a little bit better than they are. But sin is sin. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter what you look. It don't matter whether you did the same thing. If you sin, you sin. And that's all to it. And I remember seeing the smile on his face. And something inside of me just kind of jumped a little bit. It just jumped a little bit. And, and, and I, I, I just, I, I wasn't asking for much. All I wanted was somebody to make me feel like I'm worth it. And he got closer. And I could see the smile didn't go away. He could see me. See, no, 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 you don't get it. He could see, listen, he could see me. He saw my rags. He saw my skin. He could see me, but it didn't mess with his smile at all. He still kept coming. He could see what I was. He could see all the, the filth and all the stuff that I had been. He could see it, and he still kept coming. And, and then I noticed as he got closer, I could see in his eyes that he wasn't looking at me the same way. And then as he got closer, I seen his arms come up like this to me. And I know despite whatever I was, despite whatever I had done, despite what I smelled like, despite how I just, he was still willing to take me and hold me in his arms and still willing to love me despite all the other stuff. Despite what I had done, despite what I looked like, he was willing to take me and he was willing to hold me. And I wasn't asking for a whole lot. See, at that moment, all I want is to know that somebody loved me. Somebody cared. Even if I had to walk away as a leper, at least I know somebody loved me and somebody cared for me. Somebody saw past the clothing and past the skin and saw my heart. I wasn't a bad guy. Listen, for many of you, we weren't bad guys. We just tossed into some stuff, and we're trying to survive, and we're coming up with everything we can get our hands on to do it. It didn't make me a bad guy. It didn't make you a bad guy. But sometimes the rest of the world look at us like we're filthy, like we're dirt, and like we've done something wrong, and we can never get out of it again. See, see, I got this picture. I got this picture in my head of him just sitting there and just knowing what I needed most. Somebody to love me. Not look at how I got there. Sometimes in the church, that's what we tend to do. We look at how you got here to the church. We look at all your history, all your past stuff you've done, how you got here. But let me tell you, when it comes to Jesus, it don't matter how you got there. What's important is that you got there. What's important doesn't matter about all that bad stuff. It doesn't matter about that. Yes, we messed up, but that's not important to Jesus. I'll always carry that picture in my head, him sitting there holding me. And here's the problem. I'm more conscious about what I smell like. I'm more conscious about what I look like than he is because there he is dressed in white and he couldn't care less about what I look like. And when you come to Jesus with all the filth of sin and all the issues and all the problems, he's not looking at how you got there. He just want to love your own end despite your past. Despite your history, despite all of that, he just want to 
to love your ears and say, listen, from today on, it don't matter anymore. It don't matter. Hallelujah. Ah! Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Yeah, but you don't know how they treated me in the last town I was in. You're not in that town now. But you don't know how they treated me in my last relationship. You're not in that relationship now. When I was in jail, they treated me bad. You're not in jail now. I got the key. <laughs> I got the key. You don't ever have to worry about it again. Because as long as you walk with me, nobody will ever lock you up again. Nobody will ever put you back in bondage again. You'll never have to put on that same stuff ever again. Because as long as you stay with me, I got you. I got you. We spend more time trying to tell God about our history than God want to hear. He was there. He already know what you did. He know what you was. He know what you did this morning. He know what you did last night. That ain't important. It's where you're at right now. It's where you're at right now. And God sees love for you. Nothing else matters. I didn't understand the song. And we would sing it, not sing it with everybody. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood. I didn't understand the song. I didn't get it. I didn't get it. I didn't get it that when he says he washes away, he restores you. And you'll ever have to be what you ever was again. You never have to ever look backwards ever again. All things truly are passed away with him. Behold, all things have become new. It's gone. Yeah, but I, I knew that when I told you old things were passed away. Yeah, but, no, I knew that. When you come to me, I give you a fresh start. The world may still look at you crazy, but as far as I'm concerned, you're a new creation. There's nothing held against your account between me and heaven. You've been washed clean. You've been restored. And now you can hold your head up. Now you can step and walk them up. You see, none of you in here is any better Christian than anybody else in here, okay? Are you, are you hip to that? Huh? I don't care what you may walk in the door, and you may look at somebody else and may thought you, you ain't no better than anybody else. The love of God, it took the love of God for every one of us, and that puts you... Yeah, but I just came to Christ and you got as much love for God as I have. God loves you as much. He don't give you weak blood to wash away your sins because you just came. You get the same blood everybody else get. You get washed thoroughly clean. You see, now it's left up to you because see, now God washes you. Where you want to go? Do you want to go back? See, here's what I felt. As I sit there and I, he held me in his arm, I began to notice something was going on. I began to notice that my joints wasn't hurting any longer. I began to notice that my skin wasn't burning anymore. I looked down. I realized that my rags was gone and I realized I was dressed in another gown now with no problems, no sin, no hurt, no mistake. And I realized as I held on to him, I stayed and, and, and he, he just, and I was thinking, oh Lord, maybe I'm holding you too long. Maybe I need to let go. But he wasn't bothering him at all. He didn't care if I held on to him all day long and just hold on to him and just love on him. He wasn't going to get tired of loving. That's what he is. Do you hear me? Because some of you got the idea that after a while he don't love you like he used to love you. And I'm here to tell you that you're looking at the wrong God. Because the God I serve is love is perfect. He'll love you, love you, love you, love you, and keep right on loving you. He'll keep right on loving you and keep right on loving you and keep right on loving you. 
I'm not here to tear down any other churches. I'm not here to tear down anybody's doctrine. I'm just here to introduce them to a real God, to a real Jesus, a God that loves you. Despite, 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 despite what you may have done, despite where you may have come, and what he wants you to do is he wants you to see him as not a judge. He wants you to see him as a father. He wants to see one who loves you and understands what you've been through. And he wants you to know the price has already been paid on the cross. Your sins have been laid, but he recognized that you need to come to him and you need to walk with him. Some of you that's been walking with God for a while, you're still carrying the weight of your sin every time and you get weighted and down. But the Bible says lay aside every sin and every weight that so easily besets you. You got to lay that aside. You got to remember that Jesus loves you yeah. no matter what. No matter what. No matter what. Right. That's a hard thing for some people to grasp. Yeah. That he keeps right on loving. Yeah. He may not like what you do, but it don't change him from loving you. Huh? He still loves you. And he says he wants you to understand. He wants you to know the length and the height and the breadth and the depth of this love. Yeah. Immeasurable love that he has for you and has for me. You see, when I woke up, I knew where I could never go back again. I knew I could never, ever be away from the embraces of his love. Sometimes when I pray and when I worship, and I know everybody be getting into their little thing and y'all do it, but I'll find myself for a moment, I, I just don't have any words. I, I just don't have, it seems like sometimes, forgive me because I believe very much in speaking, but I believe sometimes there's a place you get where you're choked up and there's just no words that you can come up with. All you can do is just hold on and love. That's all you can do is and just, just let the sun, the S-O-N, shine down on you and shine in you. Just sit there and just love. Not fancy words, Lord, I remember when you brought me out. No, right now, it isn't even about what you brought me out of. It's about just loving you because you, you love me, Lord, because you love me, Lord, because you never gave up on me. Other people, Lord, I just want to just love you. I just want to love you. And it may not make sense. It may not fit somebody's doctrine, but I just want to love you. I just want to love you and love you and love you and love you and love you because that's what you keep doing every day of my life you just keep loving and loving and loving on me Lord so if I get quiet if I get out of my chair if I get on my knees if I get away from everything else everybody is doing, leave me alone and let me and God just love on each other. But sometimes that's what I need. Because you don't know what my day was like. You don't know what my week was like. You don't know the last time somebody smiled at me or made me feel like I was a human being. But when I think about the leper, I know no matter how bad off I am, I know that no matter how bad sin stinks on me, no matter what any of that look like, and his arms are still stretched out. And he says, I'm ready to embrace you anytime you want me to. Let me. Just let me. I 
I didn't know about restoration. I knew about apostles of Christ in Oklahoma City. But I remember when we opened the doors and people started coming in. Because they just wanted somebody to love them. And let me tell you something. There's some of you may be here today. Here's a word to you. You've come home. Uh, you've come home. It's as much your home as it is anybody else. It's your home. And now he wants to get the chains off because, see, he wants you knowing that you're at home. You're free to experience his love in a deeper way than maybe you've ever, 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 ever known. And some people ain't going to like you for that. But when you're going through your hell, not one of them been able to help you. When you're going through your loneliness, not one of them showed up to help you. When you're going through your pain, not one of them's there to experience your pain. When you feel like you don't belong and you don't know where you are and you don't understand because you haven't really received Jesus into the family of God and you feel like, God, I'm just here and I'm just lost. They don't know what you're going through, nor can they give you what you need. They can talk about you. They can give you hell, but they can't take you out of hell. I remember I heard the word that morning in a little Metropolitan Baptist Church. I was already crying before I got out the chair. My wife was crying harder than I was. And we didn't know what to do next. All we knew was something was wrong and we heard about a God that loved us and all we knew was that we wanted him. I don't even know if we understood an altar call or not. All I know is that we both jumped up and took off running toward the front and we said, if that's the God of love, if he can forgive me for all the stuff I've done, if he can take away my pain and take away my hurt, it don't matter and I don't care what anybody in this fancy place thinks. I don't care. You know why I don't care? Because they can't feel my hurt and my pain. And I'm tired of it and I don't want it anymore. I don't care what anybody else thought. And what you may need may be so simple. You may just need somebody to put their arms around you. Not thinking about what you've done, but just loving you. Just loving you despite what you've done and where you come from. Here's the scary about it sometimes as believers. We still get into that place. We still get in that place where we feel alone and lonely and we don't want anybody to. Sometimes I'm so lonely I don't know what to do and I want to tell my wife but it's like she can't grasp what's going on with me because she can't ride it out in here. And I'll go to the altar and it seems like when I leave Everything is all right. Because a human couldn't give me what I was really looking for. Only God. Please stand to your feet. <clears throat> I'm one of those who believe in the power of the anointing. I believe that God watches over his word. And God is careful, and I believe God is watching over this word this morning. And 
He's called the healing balm of Gilead. He says, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden. You weighed it down. He said, I will give you rest. Listen. This is the only altar call. If you've been weighted down, if you've been struggling and you, you, you're struggling and there's those moments you just feel so alone and so, listen to me. I trust the anointing. I'm saying now is the time, not after church, coming up to me and Jones and saying, pray for me after you've missed the anointing. We can pray for you, but you miss the anointing. Here's what I believe, that God wants you free. That God wants you, that since that leper, that lonely, God wants to break that. And God wants you to know you'll, he'll always be with you. You'll never, ever be alone again. If God's got to send somebody all the way from China just to give you that love that you need, God will send somebody there. And they'll, listen, God will make it happen because God loves you so much. It was not an accident that that leper was on that street and Jesus come walking by. But Jesus knew down on that road by that tree there was an old, tired, broken down, lonely, hurting leper that needed, that needed to know that he was loved. 36 years later, Here's what I know. He has never left me. He has never forsaken me. But he's kept on loving me. If you've been struggling, listen, here's the, here it is. And you've been struggling, you've been feeling weighted, you've been feeling, where do I? And it seems like it doesn't make sense to you. Listen to me, come this morning. Come and somebody's going to come and they're going to pray with you. And they're going to pray for God to give you what you need.